Uh, we're going to move right along to our next speaker. We're going from a well-established career scientist to a, a new career, early career scientist. We've got Amrinder Jakar, who's about to defend his master's thesis uh, through Mississippi State. He's working with Jagmin Dillon, Dillon and Drew Golson, our own NCAR Drew Golson. Um, and he's going to be talking about the impact of sugarcane biochar application rates on soil properties and water quality under rain-fed cotton production in the Mississippi Delta. Come on over. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, as she mentioned, that I'm doing my master's under Dr. Golson and Dr. Dillon at uh, ANCA. And uh, this is a part of my research, uh, and this is the first chapter the impact of a sugarcane biochar application rates on soil properties and water quality under the rain fed cotton production in the Mississippi Delta. So, first, I will move to the introduction. Uh, Mississippi, this delta region is like a highly productive region and it can it grows uh, about 80% of the crops grown throughout the Mississippi. But like uh, there is a lot of conventional tillage practices going on and earlier this belt is a cotton belt and earlier a lot of cotton was produced here and cotton needs a fine seed belt. So to make a fine seed belt, there are a lot of tillage practices are uh, gone on. And in this all this process, there is a lot of problems come in the soil, like uh, soil depth deterioration. And now we are facing the problems such as uh, soil compaction, low organic uh, matter, and as told, uh, soil structure is lo also lost. And due to this, uh, there is increase in the nutrient leaching losses to the subsurface water. And as we are in this uh, time, we are increasing the fertilizer use also to increase the yield. So we are using a lot of fertilizers to that also increases the nutrient leaching losses. And we may contaminate uh, our subsurface water and in the, some parts uh, of the country. We have already seen that uh, we can see the nitrate and nitrate contents in the subsurface water too. So this study will be uh, to determine that whether biochar can improve the soil properties and uh, or and improve the water quality or not. So for this, we have uh, potential solutions could be a strip tillage. Use of cover crops could be a good potential, but uh, usually cover crops takes uh, four or five years to show its effects. And in the initial years, it also reduces the uh, yields. So the next man, the amendment which I'm using is the soil amendment, and which is a amendment I'm using is the biochar application. So we have uh, two different objectives. I have already mentioned that uh, whether it biochar can improve the soil properties, and similarly whether it can reduce the nutrient leaching losses or not. So first, uh, may some of you don't know that what is a biochar. A uh, biochar could be like uh, uh, any organic carbon uh, matter which is largely assisted to the decomposition. So it can be like prepared from the any organic matter. It could be like the leaves uh, or wood stocks. It could be any organic matter, whichever you can think. And we uh, like uh, we did the thermal decomposition of the organic matter in the like absence of the oxygen or in the limited presence of the oxygen and uh, whatever the leftover is the is, a, is the biochar and the process is known as a pyrolysis and the biochar which i'm using in this study the feedstock used for this is the sugarcane bagges so sugarcane bagges like in louisiana this is imported from the louisiana there when they extract the like uh, juice from the sugarcane the leftover which is there that is called as the bagges and uh, they use it, they burn it and uh, use it to produce the electricity. And the leftover is uh, known as a, uh, like a biochar and we use it as a soil amendment. So there are the earlier studies in which it is, has been already uh, like uh, proved that biochar could be a good potential to improve the aggregate stability, reduce its bulk density. And it can reduce the nutrient leaching losses as a biochar has a high cation exchange capacity. So it can bind the nice to it and uh, reduces its nutrient leaching losses to the subsurface water. So uh, objectives I have already mentioned. Um, next move to my materials and methods. This study uh, was conducted at the <coughs> USDA ARS crop production research farm Stoneville. And the design is completely randomized design. Uh, the soil type is a commerce very fine sandy loam. 
and the plot mentions in length we have 9.15 meter and in width we have 6 meters each plot has six rows with a row spacing of uh, 1.02 meter and we have a four application in this uh, uh, like uh, study the variety we use is a pythogen phy430 and uh, uh, we, we use the seeding rate is 120,555 seeds per hectare so uh, next is my treatments i use the three different biochar application rates that 10 20 40 milligram per hectare and the fourth <coughs> plot we have the control or you can see the uh, untreated plot so next move to the materials and methods uh, we have collected a deep core soil samples using the getting probes that you can see in the top image and we have collected the deep core samples from 0 to 60 centimeter depth and then we um, divide into the 50 centimeter of the increments and then we determine the bulk density and after determining <coughs> the bulk density we break down the soil into three different aggregate sizes that's 0 0.5 to 1, 1 to 2 and 2 to 4 ml of aggregates and that we use to determine the aggregate stability, total carbon, total hydrogen and per magnet oxidizable carbon. So we have also collected uh, soil cores in the spring season in the April 2021 and 2022, which we determine for the bulk density, gravimetric water content, and the volumetric water content and penetration, soil infiltration uh, measurements were uh, an estimated softivity was uh, determined using the corner sprinkler infiltrometer. And we have also collected the soil samples from the two depths from 0 to 15 and 16 to 30 centimeter for determining the soil fertility. Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to that. This study is uh, started in 2019, and I started collecting the samples in the second and the third year of the study. So, for determining the nutrient leaching losses, as earlier Dr. Sassi has uh, mentioned about the lysimeters, I'm also using the lysimeters, but this is not that expensive of 1 million. This is uh, like only five, two to 500 dollars of lysimeters. So we have installed two suction cup lysimeters, uh, one at the 41 centimeter depth, another is at the 86 centimeter depth. And uh, throughout the study, I have collected uh, 42 events, out of which uh, are 28 are from the fallow season and 14 uh, are from the cotton season. And uh, once the soil solution is collected, it is determined for the pH EC. And we determine the anions in our lab only, and the anions were determined such as nitrate, nitrite, chloride, phosphate, and the sulfate. And the monical nitrogen is determined uh, on the latchet. For determining the cations, like such as calcium, sodium, iron, magnesium, and potassium, we mix the soil solution uh, on a monthly basis and we send them to the Brookside laboratories on determining the uh, to determine the cations on the ICP. We mix we, to make a composite sample for a month because we have collected a lot of samples and it's really expensive to get samples analyzed from the outside. So the image which you can see is of a suction cup lysimeter. We install this in the field. So when soil solution like a rain is there, like a half an inch of the rain is there, Water starts from, from the top and it goes down. And this is the ceramic suction cup. And we create a vacuum in the suction cup lysimeters. And uh, when there is a less pressure in the suction cup lysimeters, soil solution uh, moves from outside to inside. And later on, we take out uh, soil solution with the help of creating a pressure. And later on, we bring it to the R lab. So for statistical analysis, I use the SAS. For determining the soil solution data for fallow and the cotton season. Fallow means that there is a no crop and we collect the soil solution throughout the year. We use the like uh, repeated measure analysis on the soil solution data. And for the soil data, we use uh, ANOVA. And uh, for some data, we use one way ANOVA. And for some, we have used uh, two way ANOVA. Like when there is a depth factor, it's two way, and when it's not depth, so only biochar application rate, then we use one way ANOVA. And uh, the alpha we use is the 0 0.05.
So next move to the results and discussion that's really important that everybody wants to know the most. Mm -hmm. So first I want to talk about uh, gravimetric and the volumetric water control. <coughs> so first talk about uh, gravimetric uh, uh, water content in sp like uh, spring 2021 and spring 2022. The gravimetric water content uh, like you can see the first in the like a blue Bars, the dark blue is of uh, 2021 and the light blue is of uh, 2022. In this, you can see that a gravimetric water content is uh, improved on the top soil depth of 0 to 15 centimeters with the increase in the biochar application rates like as the uh, 10, uh, 10 is increased and on the 40 is also increased. And similarly for, uh, for the second uh, year, that's 2022, we can see that uh, it's increased again with the all three biochar application rates. But as we go to the lower soil depths, that 16 to 20 centimeters, we doesn't see any significant differences in the gravimetric water content. And for the volumetric water content, uh, for spring 2021, that's the second year, we doesn't see any significant differences. But in the third year of the study, that spring 2022, we have seen that uh, volumetric water content is also improved with a biochar application of 20 and 40 milligram per hectare. And uh, at the lower uh, depth of 60 to 30 centimeter, it is improved with the all three biochar application rates compared to the control plot. So next move to the soil bulk density here on the x-axis you can see the biochar application rates and the two soil depths and on the y-axis is the bulk density. So first uh, talk about like a fall 2020 in that year we doesn't see any significant differences in the bulk density but the mean values you can see it's decreasing with the higher biochar application. So the, in third year that's in fall 2021 we have seen that biochar application reduces the solid bulk density with a 20 and 40 milligram per hectare. And similarly, when we move to the spring 2021, like I told, we collected for the fall and spring, we've seen that a biochar application uh, rate at the higher rates of uh, 40 milligram reduces the solid bulk density, but in the low soil depth, it doesn't see any significant differences in uh, all four uh, our uh, collection data. So next move to the penetration resistance. So again on the x-axis you can see the biochar application and on the y-axis is the penetration resistance values. So for the second year we doesn't see any significant differences in the penetration that uh, uh, because we doesn't see any decrease in the bulk density so it's uh, we anticipated that it doesn't uh, impact on the penetration resistance too. But uh, in the third year you can see that uh, Higher biochar application of the 40 milligram per hectare decrease the penetration resistance of the soil significantly. So next move to the like a steady state of infiltration and the estimated uh, subjectivity of the soil. On the secondary axis is the steady state infiltration and on the primary axis is the uh, estimated subjectivity and uh, on x-axis you can see the biochar application rate. So we have uh, done this only for the first year, second year, that's uh, 2021. In the third year, we uh, did, uh, doesn't uh, grow cotton, so I haven't collected the data from that season. So in this, we have seen that estimated subjectivity of the soil is uh, improved at a higher biochar application rate of 30 milligram per hectare. We have seen that uh, soil infiltration is uh, also improved uh, at 40 milligram per hectare, but it's uh, not a significantly improved. I think it's a p value of this uh, is uh, 0.567. So it's almost uh, significantly, but we can't say that it's significant. So next move to the soil aggregate stability. And uh, this could be a little bit confusing, but I make it a little bit like easy to understand. So this on um, this is like an interaction uh, table. Here is the biochar application rates in this column, and the second column is uh, soil depth. I told that the four different uh, depths of 15 centimeters increment. So as I told that we got into three aggregate size fractions. So for second year, that's 2020, we have seen that uh, aggregate stability is improved for uh, smaller aggregates 0.5 to one. 
at a higher biochar application of 40 microgram per hectare. And uh, for the second and third year 2021, all three biochar application uh, rates improve the aggregate stability of the soil compared to the control plot. And for 1 to 2 mm uh, uh, size aggregates, we doesn't see any significant differences in the second year. And but in the third year, higher uh, biochar application rates improve the aggregate stability of the soil. And for 2 to 4 mm size correction, we doesn't see any significant differences. But you can see for the both years, uh, mean aggregate sizes is uh, improved for both years. So next move to the CN ratio that I have told that reflected for total carbon, total nitrogen. So for uh, this is a similar table on like a biogen application and the soil depth. So for 2020, we doesn't see any significant differences in the CN ratio. But uh, so this we anticipated that it will change the CN uh, ratio because biochar is a, uh, like a 70 to 80 percent of the carbon. So you are adding the carbon to the soil. So CN ratio will be change of the soil. So uh, for second year, it doesn't see any significant differences in all three aggregate sizes. But for 2021, we have seen that for small aggregate sizes, CN ratio improved with the 20 and 40 milligram per hectare. And for the uh, 1 to 2 mm, only higher biochar application, 40 milligram per hectare improved the CN ratio. And for 2 to 4 mm size aggregates, 20 and uh, 40 milligram per hectare improved the soil aggregate CN ratio of the soil. So next move to the PUXC, that's per magnet oxidizable carbon. This is uh, like uh, also part of the total carbon only, but it is uh, highly changeable. So when we change anything to the like a tillage practices, anything, the uh, the first thing that we change is the only we can know that whether there is anything changing in the soil is can determined using the PUXC. So we also go for the PUXC. So this is a similar, almost similar result stacks of a total CN ratio. So uh, for the second year, we doesn't see any significant differences for all three aggregate sizes. But uh, for uh, 2021, for small aggregate 0.5 to m, all three biochar application uh, rates improve the PUXC of, of the soil. And for 1 to 2, only higher biochar application of 40 milligram improve the PUXC. And for 2 to 4 m, all three biochar application uh, rates see significant differences compared to the control plot. So next I want to move to the nutrient leaching losses that could be like a big problem maybe in the near future now also there is a lot of research projects going on to reduce the nutrient leaching losses and uh, in this graph is the interaction graph about that what are the ions which were affected by the biochar application rates as I already told that we have two soil depths for the installing the suction cup lithimeters. 46 and uh, 81 centimeters. And on the secondary axis, you can see the electrical conductivity. And uh, on the primary axis, the chloride sulfate and the sodium concentrations uh, were there. So first, I want to move to the chloride concentration. So on the, for the uh, 46 centimeter depth of the lysimeters, we have seen that uh, Chloride concentrations were reduced at 10 and 40 milligram per hectare. And when we go to the lower depth of 81 centimeter, chloride concentration were reduced on 20 and 40 milligram per hectare. So for uh, next, I want to move to the nitrate uh, leaching losses. That's the most uh, problematic or could we have to reduce most that. For nitrate leaching losses for the 46 centimeters, we can see that uh, if compared to the control, all three biochar application uh, rates reduce the nitrate leaching losses. And then we move to the lower depth of 81 centimeters. All three biochar application reduce the nitrate leaching losses. And at the 40, it almost becomes uh, zero. So there is a no leaching losses uh, taking place at uh, 30 milligram per hectare. So next I want to talk about the sulfate that is in light green color. So sulfate and the sodium that is in a dark color. So sulfate and sodium concentrations were, we have seen that little bit uh, increase uh, with the biochar application rates. And for sodium, we have the lab report that our biochar, uh, biochar has a 
higher sodium concentration. But for the sulfate, we doesn't have any lab report that what is the concentration of sulfate in biochar. But uh, like it highly depends on the like what temperature biochar is prepared and what is the feedstock. So the feedstock which we are using in uh, I have already told that is the sugar cane. So may in Louisiana that there is a recommendation uh, to apply the sulfur in the lower uh, where is the lesser sulfur in the soil. So it could be like uh, farmers may apply the sulfur uh, to the sugar cane. So may it can uh, come from that that our biochar could have a higher sulfur concentration. So for the electrical connectivity that you can see in that is in top uh, blue line. For the above uh, uh, depth of uh, lysimeters 46 centimeter, the like results were inconsistent. But as we go to the 81 centimeter depth, the electrical connectivity reduced significantly on 20 and 40 microgram per hectare. So as uh, nutrient leaching losses, uh, like there were lesser ions, so electrical connectivity is reduced also. So this is the graph the, of the ions which was only uh, affected by the like a biochar application and the rates previous is the interaction of the depth and the biochar application, but this is the of only biochar application. So here you can see the uh, nit nitride, bromide, phosphate, and calcium, and this is the sulfate uh, concentration. So uh, as I told that uh, I have uh, done different analysis for the fallow and the cotton season. In fallow season, we have seen the significant differences in the most of the ions. But uh, when we see come to the cotton season, we doesn't see any significant differences on the in, in, between the treatments. We have seen that only such sulfate concentrations uh, were uh, ha higher compared to the control part, but other ions were not significantly different from the control. It could be like, uh, it could be have reason that there could be a lower leaching losses in the like cotton season for throughout the season. There could be like a three reasons that it could be lower leaching. One could be like uh, that as cotton is already there. So and cotton needs nutrients, so it extracts nutrients. So there is not sufficient nutrients to leach. The uh, second could be we see more lesser uh, rainfall during the cotton season compared to the fallow season. And the third could be that this is a like a uh, rain fed st uh, study. So uh, like uh, when uh, there is a rainfall, there will be like higher evapotranspiration losses from the soil and from the plant. So may soil doesn't have uh, that much of the water to leach the nutrients uh, to the subsurface. So this is like I can could be the these three reasons that in cotton season which doesn't see any significant differences within the treatments, but in our fellow season we see the significant differences. So uh, next, uh, first is the night uh, like on axis you can see the biochar application rates, and on the secondary axis you can see the sulfate and the calcium concentration, and on the primary you, you can see the night nitrate, bromide, and the phosphate concentration. So first, the dark green color, that's uh, nitrate concentration, whose uh, concentration were reduced with biochar application on 10 and 40 milligram per hectare. So bromide concentration, all that is in light green, also reduced with all three biochar application rates. And phosphate, like uh, which could lead to the eutrification uh, uh, a fact when there is a higher leaching losses of the uh, like when there is like a higher surface losses of the phosphate. So biochar also reduces the phosphate uh, leaching losses and similarly the calcium which you can see in the purple line at 40 microgram it also reduced and this is the sulfate that you can see in the blue line. It's increased at a higher rate of a 40 microgram per hectare. So next uh, conclusion that uh, biochar is a good viper solution uh, to improve the soil properties. But like uh, 40 milligram could be hard to apply for the farmers. So we meant that uh, May 20 milligram could be a good uh, way to improve the soil properties. And it also reduces the biochar also reduces the leaching losses for the most of the ions. And only sulfate and the sodium leaching losses were increased. And that to be increased on the top depth and it doesn't see 
significant differences on the lower depth depths of 81 centimeters. So, but uh, there could be like a further study, like uh, whether it can impact on the yield losses. Uh, Dr. Sasi is doing that study that how it impacts on, on the yield of the cotton and whether it is economically viable, the 20 megram or not for the farmers. So, last I want to acknowledge all my committee members, Dr. Golson, Dr. Dillon, and Dr. Gazalaki, Dr. Kaur, and Dr. Singh, and all my lab mates and uh, our farm manager, uh, Jim Nicholas, and the administrative assistant, Ms. K. Sylvian. So, this is the reference slide which I used throughout the study. So, any questions are welcome. Thank you. Yes, Dr. You did not put my name in the thank you. Actually, there's a history behind this study. 2018, um, you know, we are thinking about uh, because this uh, and all this coming up and uh, having different discussion, uh, different uh, forums and things. Uh, one thing, you know, it, it my, my way of thinking is. Um, Always reducing irrigation or playing with irrigation is not a solution to check the depletion of a cucumber. You have to make use of rainwater to the extent possible and try to grow crops. With that intention, we thought about bringing biochar and try to improve soil properties, physical properties for storing more water. Okay, with that, can you grow rain fed uh, cotton or rain fed corn? Soybean or cotton with the, uh, without irrigation. That's why the experiment became rain fed. There is no irrigation. So in 2019, uh, Gurbir, uh, you know, uh, because we were asked to collaborate between the city state. So Gurbir, uh, and we wrote a project and got my from uh, USGS and this. And you also hired. Yeah, thank you. I'm very, very happy to see the results. This is like yeah. a magic seminar, so I presented the same, so I forgot to put yeah. it. For me, it's like a dream coming true because I see the difference in soil quality. Very, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Tanner. So, how much does it cost for the 20 mega? Uh, so, biochar cost us $50 for the yeah. 20 mega. So it is not high, but uh, may economical. Fifty dollars per ton. Yes. So this will be how much? Tw the twenty. Uh, a mega is a ton, right? Yes. Oh, are you talking about uh, fifty dollars a metric ton or fifty dollars a short ton? That's one good. megagram of uh, one megagram uh, for fifty dollars. Oh, so one twenty one into fifty, so hundred dollars. So a thousand so dollars per hectare. Yes. Okay, and is it worth it? The economical analysis haven't been done. You know, here, uh, the but uh, for solid practice, it's worth and it's reducing the nutrient leaching. Yeah, yeah. Here, I mean, we did uh, some economic analysis for other crops. The uh, cost of the material is not not a problem coming. I mean, it's very cheap. Okay, compared to the transportation. Transportation cost is the main thing uh, coming in this. If you add transportation cost, everything else goes. It's complete loss. Okay. So a thousand dollars with transportation costs? No, before. You add a transportation fees with that? It, yes, that. I think it's fifty dollars we added that to add it, yeah. If you don't add it, it's just the material. Yeah, I mean if you don't add all that I cost you, yeah. you'll make a profit every <laughs> time. No, no, no. But what what are you saying is that you were farming right next to the sugar? I mean, yeah. What I'm saying is in future. You know, if somebody is interested, okay, if yeah, people need biochar, they start a company here. Yeah. Go yeah. Then your transportation loss is gone. That's it. So, a uh, company that, so you you have to have a sugar cane production? Is that what? How, no, how no, no. Biochar can be any material, any uh, what you call uh, biomass. Right. Okay. This and is a byproduct of burning, burning. Yeah, even, burn. even you know, hay, hay, you know, the, the, Residue left behind uh, uh, after uh, harvesting crops here. It can be any material. And in uh, Fort Collins, we call it biocar. I don't know why. Biocar is uh, produced from uh, litter in the forest. Forest. Like a forest. Biocar. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to go ahead and thank everyone for coming. And you can leave if you want, but I am going to go ahead and let some people ask some more questions if you're interested in hanging out.
If not, we'll see you in February and thanks for attending. What was your question, Zach? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I noticed in some of the sole properties, uh, you're seeing a, a bit of a temporal trend, you know, going from 2021 and this year. Um, I was wondering, do you think that temporal trend would continue if you uh, carried out the experiment longer or would it flatten out after so long? Or? At some point, it will flatten out, but uh, in two in three years, we are seeing that uh, mostly that but I have seen that biochar starts showing its effect in the second year and uh, third year you can see the most significant differences in most of the properties so i think according to like uh, me you can't add like a biochar every year if i have to redesign a study i will do alternative years because if you are adding uh, biochar to the soil so you are changing the cn ratio of the soil so either you have to increase your uh, nitrogen concentration, but then it will increase your fertilizer cost. And again, all the things will be increased because in the field, I don't know what is the yield and all that thing, but in the field, you can see the in a higher biological application rates, usually cotton is shorter because it is not getting the nitrogen as for its needs. So, and this biogel which I'm using is a pelletized, so it takes time to decompose, but it is easy to apply. But uh, usually what most of the other scientists and I have read, that usually most common used is a powdered form of biochar. So it can show the results faster in a year because it's powder, it has a higher surface area, so it can easily decompose. But the biochar which we use, it's in pellets as I show in the picture. So it takes time to decompose uh, in the soil. So it says this biochar shows us usually in the second year. So, but it has to be made after an apple will continue with the study. And so then how, how, how often is the application? Annual. They only apply once. No, we apply, no, we apply it for this every year. Okay. Every year. year. Like a problem. But there is a cumulative impact on these mm -hmm. applications, right? So presumably there'll be a time where you stop applying. Is that right? It, it can be. Yeah. So but it can be. So if it can be, I would suggest in your economic analysis, you don't only yes. look at operational profit, but there is a capitalization effect to it. Uh, you know, it's not it's not just a season to season effect. If if, if, it, if there is something that accumulates and can stay there for a while, that's that's more like capital than than an input. Yes, like uh, if uh, whenever this study is stopped. Uh, I think like there could be like if we start sampling, if nobody takes that field, uh, I think if we take the samples every year, I think its impact will last for the next five to ten years. There's residual. Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, this study uh, right now, because I'm with the water management, uh, I started when I was with the crop production systems. So crop production systems is continuing this study. Yeah, I'm only helping them. So at least uh, they'll continue for five more years. But my part is becoming doubtful now because my technology is leaving. I don't want to come in there. <laughs> so, Andrew, approved? did you have a question? Let's move to Andrea's question. Andrea's, let's move to Andrea's question. Stay on top, we're recording. So. <laughs> um, so. I just wanted to make sure I did understand correctly that you analyzed the ions and stuff in the soil pore water that you extracted from certain depths. Is that right? Yes, yeah, soil solution, you can yeah. see, yeah. Okay, then just a word of caution you cannot really call this leaching losses because it's not been lost yet. It has only moved, and since the roots also go into the deeper depth, they could still be taken out. And so, my question related to that is. The decreasing concentrations in nitrate, for example, could they also just indicate a reduction in fertility? Mm. Sorry, like I didn't know the last part of the question. So instead of uh, a reduction in nitrate leaching losses, could it be also an indication of a reduced fertility? Like uh, I have read that uh, usually it's uh, like uh, for cotton, the uh, like uh, its roots can reach up to five feet. That I agree, but uh, read some papers that usually the feeder roots uh, for the most of the ions 
it could be on like uh, 40 to 45 centimeters. So for above depth, may we can see that the fertility could be the analysis, but for the low depth, or either I have to go more depth, but uh, that I agree that it could be for the fertility too, for the top depth. And Andrew, what you mean by that is that because we've disrupted the CNN ratio, drastically increasing carbon, the nitrogen, the, the the mineral nitrogen is going towards, um, you know, decomposition of the biochar rather than yeah, for example, in the something. source. If yeah, I'm thinking either, yeah, I'm thinking either of uh, denitrification being increased because of feeding of the denitrifiers with carbon, sure, sure. or it could be just bound sort to the biochar itself. Yeah. And so I just wonder if it's just unavailable for the plants and so not being in the like when we add a carbon to the soil. Uh, there is a, so, so I have seen some papers that with the biochar, the microbial activity like is a increased lot. So it could be a loss due to the immunization losses too. But if it is like a stored in the soil, then it could be really good because once uh, there is a decomposition of the biochar, then may be available back to the crop. So if we are using like a powder form of a biochar that can uh, decompose faster. So at the starting of the uh, like uh, planting, we apply and we apply the nitrogen may it conserve and throughout the season it can uh, release the nitrogen to the crop slowly. It could be possible. That's how you're doing so. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and call this. Um, thanks you all for coming again. And yeah, see you. Thank you online people. Yeah. I don't know.